So, uh, those of you who do not have a Bible, probably a good idea to grab one, as is the usual. While y'all are getting that, I want to say welcome. We have a couple people who are hanging out with us tonight for the first time. We have a couple people who are back again. Uh, Maddie, both Maddies are back to visit us, so that's awesome. And we got Caitlin brought a couple of friends, so make sure to make them feel very welcome, and um, we're very grateful they are here. So, uh, before we get knee-deep into this, I am going to pray, and then we'll get started. Dear Heavenly Father, God, thank you again for this opportunity for us to come together in fellowship and discuss your word and all that you do through history, Lord. And we are just so grateful for that, Lord. Thank you for the common graces that you give us, things like a beautiful day outside that we had today, Lord. God, I pray that I speak in a way that is glorifying to you and edifying to these students, Lord. Give me the wisdom to express your truth in a way that is useful, Lord. We ask all this in your name. Amen. All right, so today, this is going to be a fun one, all right? This is going to, we're going to, have to, we're going to, we're going to deal with some adult topics today, so y'all are going to have to be mature for that. So um, go ahead and open your book, your Bibles, to Genesis chapter 39. Genesis chapter 39, we're covering the whole chapter again. So like all this ties together, so again, it's a big chunk, but... There's really not a good place to break this up, in my opinion. So we're going to go through all Genesis chapter 39 today. Uh, again, I'm just going to break it up piece by piece. That way we can deal with it one little bit at a time rather than trying to, you know, eat the whole elephant in one bite. So, Genesis chapter 39. We're going to start in verse 1 and we're just going to work through it. So, Genesis chapter 39, verse 1 says this. Now, Joseph had been brought down to Egypt... And Potiphar, an officer of the Pharaoh, the captain of the guard, an Egyptian, had bought him from the Ishmaelites who had brought him down there. So when we pick up our story here in chapter 39, Joseph has now arrived in Egypt. Remember, he had been in Canaan, where he was from, where he was born and he was raised. His father loved him more than he loved any of his other brothers. He was very open about the fact that he loved Joseph more than he loved any of his other brothers. He gave Joseph, Joseph a coat that said, Dad loves me more, and I'm going to get all the money, right? We talked about this, that he was going to get all the inheritance. And Joseph, to add insult to injury, decided that this would be a good thing to brag about to his brothers and explain to them just how much more God and Dad liked him more than he liked them, right? And so the reaction that his brothers had is they had this hate-filled relationship in this very, very dysfunctional family, and it led to them attacking Joseph, beating him, throwing him down like a 30-foot well and, and telling his dad that he'd been murdered and then deciding to sell him to the Ishmaelite traders, right, who's been taken down now to Egypt. And so if we're in Joseph's shoes, what we got to understand here is Potiphar, the man who purchased him, is likely a very wealthy man who had a lot of power in the Egyptian military. It says he was the captain of the guard, which would have probably been Pharaoh's royal guard. This is not a poor man. This is a very wealthy man. And as I was writing this, I was trying to think, like, put myself in the shoes of Joseph, what these last couple of weeks have been like. He's been betrayed by his brothers. He's been beaten by his brothers. He's been thrown in a well by his brothers. And he's probably in the bottom of that well, you know, because we, we talked last week how he was begging for mercy. And then all of a sudden a rope comes down. He's probably like, oh, they're going to let me out. And then he gets to the top, and he's thrown to somebody else. And he's sold into slavery. And from there, he would have been marched hundreds of miles through the wilderness, through the scorching heat, down to Egypt. And as he gets closer to Egypt, he's going to start passing these towns on the Nile Valley, these farming communities that was very, very popular in Egypt. And then as he gets into the major cities of Egypt, probably Memphis, is probably where he went. That's the best guess. But, I mean, he's going to start seeing amazing architecture that he's never seen before, right? These are the people who made the sphinxes. These are the people who made the Great Pyramids. And one of the things we don't realize is that 
you know what the pyramids looked like when they were actually good? Like before, they, before thousands of years eroded them? They weren't brown. They were covered in marble all the way up, so they shone. They were white, and they, were, they reflected. And they had a gold piece on the top. You could see it for miles and miles away because it reflected the sun. Right? So he's seeing all of this. And this man was a nomadic sheep herder. Right? That means he lived in tents and moved around with the sheep. This man's probably never seen 300 people in one place at one time. And here he is in a bustling metropolis in Egypt. He's surrounded by Egyptian gods that he's not familiar with. Egypt was a very prominent slave trading area, so they would have had not only the Egyptian gods, but if they had slaves from other places, those gods would also be represented in this area. And into this, Joseph is brought probably with several hundred other slaves, and he's probably brought to a slave auction. And Joseph, being young, fit, and 17 years old, would have been prime property. And so the rich man Potiphar purchased him to serve. And so that's, that's all there baked into chapter, or verse 1 of chapter 39. And so that kind of sets our story as we go in to verses 2 through 6, the first part of 6. It says, And the Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man. And he was in the house of this Egyptian master. His master saw the Lord was with him, and the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. So Joseph found favor in his sight and attended him and made him an overseer of his house and put him in charge of all that was in his house and over all that he had. And the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. The blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in the house and in the field. So he left all that he had in Joseph's charge, and, he, and, he, and because of him, he had no concern about anything but the food he ate. So Joseph does really well for himself here, right? It's, it's impossible to know for sure how long Joseph was with Potiphar before he was made in charge of things. But I would imagine it would probably be at least a couple of years, right? You don't buy a slave straight off the, the block and be like, all right, here's the house, run it, right? Joseph, over a period of time, would have proved himself to be very, very resourceful and good and trustworthy. And I think the amount of, of control that Joseph was given tells us the quality of his work. Right? It tells us that he was given control over all that Potiphar had. So this means that Joseph would have been in charge of the finances. This means that Joseph would have been in charge of the fields. This means that Joseph would have been in charge of the other slaves. This means that Joseph was apparently in charge of everything except for the food because Potiphar didn't trust him with that part, which is understandable. You typically wouldn't want the people that you own as property feeding you because they could easily poison you, so that's probably not very wise. But everything else... Joseph was in charge of. Now, we learned very clearly, was it because of Joseph that he was successful? Right? Read here. The Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man. The master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord caused all that he did to succeed. Right? It was the Lord working through Joseph to create success. Now, I want to be very clear here, right? When the Bible says that the Lord gave Joseph great success, that doesn't mean that Joseph didn't do anything and God was like, poof, everything works now, right? That's not what's happening. What's happening is that Joseph is working and God is causing the work to be successful. Sometimes we kind of get this mixed up mentality where when I work and it goes well, that's my doing, and when I work and it doesn't go well, it's not my doing, right? What I think we need to see here is what's happening is that Joseph is working, Joseph is being um, committed, he's being faithful, and God is blessing that work, right? But Joseph is obviously not a lazy man. Um, we, we need to be very clear that God is not bound to give us success just because we work hard. We see that here in a couple of verses, that is most certainly not the case. But Joseph here is keeping his head down, 
and he's working and trusting God even when things are not going his way. Even when things are going against what Joseph would want, he's working and he's trusting God. We see here a man who is living out a powerful testimony. Because notice that Potiphar mentions and uses as a reason, obviously God is with this man. So Joseph's living, Joseph's faithfulness is making an impact in this household. Now, I don't think that Potiphar all of a sudden said, I'm going to worship the God of the Israelites. I don't think that's what happened. But I certainly do think that Joseph was making an impact to a level where Potiphar even recognized what was going on, or at least that something was going on. And it's also cool here to notice that Joseph never complains. Joseph never lashes out. You don't hear that from Joseph. All you see is Joseph doing the best that he can in the situation that he has been given. He simply accepts the circumstances and does his best to serve God where he is. And the fact that God chose to bless Joseph with success moved Joseph to a place where he could have an even greater impact. Right, which is the main theme, if you've been paying attention through this series, right, this is the main theme of this story, right? some of the main themes, that Joseph is Christ in miniature, and that God is divinely moving pieces in Joseph's life to accomplish his purposes. That's one of the clearest stories in the Bible to see this. Now, like I said, success or hard work doesn't always equal success. Right? We see this in this next part. So verses 6 through 10, second part of 6 through 10 says this, Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. And after a time, his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph and said, Lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Behold, because of me, my master has no concern about anything in the house, and he has put everything that he has in my charge he is not greater in this house than I am, nor has he kept back anything from me except you because you are his wife. How can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And as he spoke, uh, and as she spoke to Joseph day after day, he would not listen to her to lie beside her or to be with her. All right. So, Potiphar's wife, she's something else. She is when you read this part, right, there, there's a couple of things that stand out. One of the things that stands out is how much Joseph has grown as a man, right? Gone is the boy who would tease and mock his brothers for how much better God loves than him, right? He instead seems to be a man who has completely devoted himself to serving God in the place where he has been placed. Right? And now for Potiphar's wife, the situation that most likely is going on here is, like I said, Potiphar is rich and a powerful man. He's probably old, too. Right? And the given circumstances of that would be that in this marriage that this woman is probably no doubt forced into, or she may not be much more than what Joseph was, it was probably a political arrangement, the intimacy, so to speak, is certainly lacking and probably not very enjoyable. Right? So this is not something that she wants to be a part of, right? But she sees Joseph, and she's like, that's an option. And so she starts to pursue that option. And what's really impressive about what Joseph does here is not only his ability to withstand temptation, but the reason that he uses, the reasons that he gives for withstanding temptation. So, the reason that we resist sin is important too. The, the mere act of resistance, the mere act of not sinning is important, but the reason that you choose not to sin is also very, very important. Does that make sense? Do you hear me on that, right? So the reason that you're not sinning is important. Right? Right? We're not all tempted by the same things. Amen to that? Right? We're not all tempted by the same things. 
Sometimes we can make a point of pride for ourselves, and we do this. We say, oh, well, I don't do that. And that sin is worse than me. It's like, yeah, but you're also not tempted to do that, are you? So it's not really that impressive. Right? C.S. Lewis once said, it's, it's far more impressive for a drunkard to go two days without a drink than it is for a prude to go her entire life without having sex. Right? It's not as impressive right? for somebody who has no temptation for this sin to not commit that sin. That's not impressive. Furthermore, why are you resisting? Are you resisting sin so that you can make it a point of pride about yourself? To let other people know how holy and how good you are. You want people to see, oh, look at Chris, he doesn't sin. And I let people know I don't sin. I tell you, I went to this thing and people were doing something. Guess what? I didn't do it because I'm that good. Right? If that's your mentality, then guess what? It's no credit to you. That's exactly how the Pharisees acted. Right? We see this over and over in the New Testament. That's how the Pharisees conducted their lives. That they, they used their lack of sin as an opportunity to sin in a different way by heaping pride and praise amongst themselves. So Joseph's reasoning for not sinning is very, very important. It's very, very telling of who he is and what he values. Look at verses 7 through 9 right here, right? He says, uh, And after a time, his master's wife cast her eyes on him and said, Lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Behold, because of me, my master has no concern about anything in the house, and he has put everything that he has in my charge, and he is not greater than I. He is not greater in this house than I am, nor has he kept back anything from me except for you because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Three things that Joseph realizes. First, he realizes that this is a sin against another man. Right? He realizes that to do this would be sin against Potiphar. So he chooses not to. Second, on a practical level, Joseph knew that this would be a really, really stupid idea because you're at her whim and having sex with your master's wife is a good way to wake up dead. So he didn't do it. Right? That's a really bad idea. But third and most importantly is he realized that this was not a sin primarily against him, Potiphar, or against her, but a sin against God. That was the primary reason. He said this great sin against God. And this third point is the most important because it shows us where Joseph was spiritually. Because when you're not in communion with God, and you're not pursuing after God, you don't think like this. You hear me on that? When you are not chasing after God, these are not thoughts that you have. Right? Um, I, I know I've used this quote with you all again, but I'm going to say it again. Right? Diedrich Bonhoeffer, we've talked about, I told you what he was, but he said this quote, right? I find that when I sin, it is not because I think of hating God, but rather that I don't think of God at all. Right? So, typically, when we get caught up in sin, we cease to think about God. And Joseph here is focused on God and realizes that his sin would be against God primarily. Do you realize that whenever you sin, your primary sin is not against another individual? Your primary sin is not against yourself. Your primary sin is against God, the God who created you. And the fact that Joseph is maintaining his faith in God and desiring to please God and is having that be the primary decision-making factor is incredibly impressive and shows us where Joseph is. We should also not overlook the wisdom that Joseph has in verse 10. Because in verse 10, he says, And as she spoke to Joseph day after day, he would not listen to her, to lie beside her, to be with her. So Joseph here flees from her. He did not listen. It's a textbook way to fight sin. You know the best way to fight sin? Don't fight it, run from it. 
That's the best way to fight sin. Right? We see this over and over in the New Testament. Matthew chapter 5. Matthew 5, 20, blah, 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 29 and 30, right? If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than your whole body be thrown into hell. Right? And then you see 2 Timothy, or, yeah, 2 Timothy 2.22 Paul, speaking to Timothy, says, So flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord in a pure heart. Right? To flee your youthful passions. What we see Joseph doing and what we see Jesus and Paul describing here is what we talked about a little bit last week. Remember we talked about last week that there are four cycles to sin, or the four parts of a sin cycle. Do you remember this? We said that there's... First desire, or I'm sorry, first thought, then desire, then planning, and then action. Does this, Cody, do you remember this? Okay. So, there was first thought, then desire, then planning, and then action. Right? What we see here happening is Joseph dealing with this at the thought level before it moves on. We talked last week a decent amount of time about dealing with your sin before it gets out of control. That's exactly what's happening. Instead of waiting, instead of listening to her, instead of saying, well, maybe, you know, I know I really should. No, he doesn't even listen to her. He runs. He leaves. He distances himself from her. Do we choose to fight our sin when it's controllable, or do we choose to flirt with it until it gets out of the thought stage and into the desire stage. If you're honest with yourself, when do you start trying to fight it? Typically, we like to flirt with it until it gets to the desire stage and then maybe the planning stage and then we start trying to throw up roadblocks. That's a dumb idea and it does not work. Right? What we see here is a complete running from. Don't get near it because it'll suck you in. And Joseph is being very, very wise here. Because he knew he wanted to sin. Right? We talked a little bit on Sunday in the Sunday school class, right? And we were talking about sin briefly, right? And I mentioned that one of the reasons that we sin is because it's fun. Right? When you, when you first sin, it's pretty fun. Right? That's, that's why people do it. Right? It, it, I, I could lie to you and be like, sin is awful and no one ever enjoys themselves. No, they, they typically enjoy themselves at first. Until they don't. Right? What we need to do is distance ourselves from even getting into that area because it will pull you in. Joseph wants to sin. There's a desire. This woman is throwing herself at him. There's a desire there, but instead of sitting there and trying to fight the battle, he just avoids it. He runs from it. And there's a lot of wisdom in there for us. And then we get to probably the most tragic part. 11 through 20 says this, But one day he went into the house to do his work, and none of the men of the house were there in the house. She caught him by his garment and said, Lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled and got out of the house. And as soon as she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and had fled out of the house, she called to the men of her household and said, See, he has brought among us a Hebrew to laugh at us. He came into me to lie with me, and I cried out in a loud voice. And as soon as he heard that I had lifted my voice and cried out, he left his garment beside me and fled and got out of the house. Then she laid up his garment by her until, her master, until his master came home. And she told him the same story, saying, The Hebrew servant whom you have brought among us came into me to laugh at me. But as soon as I lifted up my voice and cried, he left his garment and, and fled the house. As soon as his master heard the words that his wife had spoken to him, this was what your servant treated me, his anger was kindled. And Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in the prison. 
I don't know about y'all, but this would probably be the point that broke me. Right? I, I, put yourself in his shoes. Joseph has done everything right. Everything right. He gets there. He does not complain. He serves God faithfully. Temptation is thrown at him over and over and over and over and over and over again. And every single time, he does everything he can and he avoids it. And then he's framed. Wouldn't have mattered. I'm glad you said that. I would have called her out for it. What do you think happens to a slave when he says that his master's wife tried to rape him? He gets his head cut off. That's what happens. There's nothing he can do. He's thrown into prison without a trial because Potiphar is that powerful. He's made to disappear. Without a trial, again, he's robbed of everything. And notice there are some parallels here. For those of you who are tracking parallels, there's some parallels because in the other earlier part of the story when people wronged him did they not take his garment and throw him in a pit here his garment again is stripped from him and he is thrown into prison right if we're also following the parallels to jesus right he stood again and did not speak before his accusers and rather was condemned without sinning but i think of how joseph must have felt after everything he had trusted God, after being betrayed by his family, he trusted God. After being sold into slavery, he trusted God. After being tempted, he clung to God. And yet he finds himself in prison. I think the natural human response would be to despair and to curse God. How many of us, right, and I know I'm speaking for me, and maybe I'm the only one in the room, but how many of us in much less circumstances when we think we do the right thing and God dares take things from us and we say, how dare you? God, you know what I do. I'm a good person. I do this and I do this. Right? And Joseph has had everything taken from him twice now. There's a lot of similarities between Joseph and Job here. In both cases, God is taking righteous men and allowing terrible, terrible things to happen to them. And in both cases, God is using Satan to accomplish his purposes. Now, hear me carefully on what I'm saying. I'm not saying that Satan and God are working together. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that Satan is a very cunning and crafty individual. He's very smart. He's very good at tempting you specifically in the way that you are weakest. Every single one in this room, Satan has a playbook on, and he knows how to play you, and he's very good at it. But the difference is, is that God is omniscient. God is perfect. God knows everything, and God knows exactly what Satan's going to do, and he knows exactly how Satan is going to tempt you. God knew how Satan was going to tempt Potiphar's wife. God knew what was going to happen. And rather than Satan accomplishing his purposes, he may in the short term accomplish what he wants when we stumble and when we sin, but God in his omniscient power and amazing ability plays Satan like a fool and moves Joseph exactly where he wants him. We see this in Job too, right? Satan comes before God and says, hey, I can make Job curse you. And God says, you think so? Right? It's always kind of funny. We kind of gloss over the fact that God already knew exactly what was going to happen. And Satan, for some reason, thought this was a game he could win. And he does, right? And God uses all of this to bring Job closer to him, to be able to reveal himself to Job. And in this case, we see God is using Satan and, and, and evil people, like Joseph's ten brothers who sold him into slavery, like Potiphar's wife, God is using these evil people to move Joseph where he needs him to accomplish his, his purpose.
For you personally, there are going to be times when you feel lost and like you've done everything right and everything's taken from you anyway. Right? Joseph's story is an incredibly edifying and encouraging story to remember in those times. And finally, verses 21 through 23 say this. If I can find it. Verse 22. And I have completely lost. We're going to start at 20 because I can't find 21. And Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, the place where his king's prisoners were confined, and there he threw him in prison. There it is. All right. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever's done there, he was the one who did it. And the keeper of the prison paid no attention to anything that was in Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made it succeed. Is anyone noticing a pattern here? Are we seeing a cyclical pattern in Joseph's life? Nobody? We are? Josh is. Josh is following. Okay, good. Right? We see this cyclical pattern. Men do evil to Joseph. God allows evil to be done to Joseph to put him in a position, and then God blesses him in that position to raise him up and to make him powerful and useful where he put him. Every time Joseph is put in a situation, he chooses to serve God, and God blesses Joseph. Joseph's time in prison runs parallel to the time that he's in Potiphar's house. It's the same thing. He shows himself faithful, and God shows himself mighty, and the person in charge trusts Joseph. This is because God has a particular purpose for Joseph's life that will not be overturned. There is nothing that Potiphar can do. There is nothing that Potiphar's wife can do. There is nothing that Judah or Reuben or any of the others can do to overturn what God is going to do in Joseph's life. And we need to remember that God is using these moments to prepare Joseph for the task that lies ahead. And regardless of how dark things seem, regardless of how terrible the situation We have to remember that God is perfect. And because God is perfect, God will glorify himself. And when God is glorified, the people who love God find joy. Does that make sense? When God is glorified, the people who love God find joy. And this is why, as Christians, we are told that we can find joy in all circumstances. Because... When your life is great and when life is pleasurable and things are going well and God is glorified, that brings you joy. But when things are bad and things are going terribly and you look and you see the way that God is moving, God is glorified. And that should bring us joy. Because we know that God's plan is much bigger than us. And we know that we are all moving to an eternal destination with Him. And that's what gives us hope. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for who you are, Lord. We thank you for the story of Joseph, Lord. We thank you for you preserving his life and all that came from him, including our salvation in Jesus Christ. And God, we just pray that you would strengthen each one of us and edify each one of us to be more like you. God, and to be faithful in tough situations and be faithful in good situations, Lord, to trust you completely. God, we ask all this in your name. Amen. All right, a couple of announcements. Coming up, coming up. So, first things first, Edge Academy. We talked about this some, a couple of Wednesdays ago. We talked about it again on Sunday. So, This is going to be this academic arm of our ministry. Hear me. This is going to be the academic arm of the ministry. What is going to be involved in this is these classes are are not going to be Sunday school classes. These classes are going to be meant to sharpen you. Well, Sunday school classes are. But these are going to be more academic in nature, right? Like there's going to be time. Like you will get a book. 
and you won't have to read the whole book, but there are going to be parts where I say, hey, before you come to class next week, I need you to have read from page, to page 15 to page 18, and I need you to have read that and be ready to talk about it, right? It is much more academic in nature, and it's going to push you. This, we're starting with simply apologetics. Apologetics means to defend the faith, right? So you are going to learn how to defend your faith, how to understand your faith. More than just defending, when you can explain why you believe what you believe, you believe it better and stronger and deeper.